morning, everyone, and welcome to Water's Edge United Methodist Church, where we are a community that connects God and people wherever they are. I want to send a welcome out to our online community again this week who is joining us for the second time. And if you are going on vacation, you can always take us with you. Uh, just visit our Facebook page, and you can click on the link. We're always there with you. For now, I invite you to stand and sing with us.
So not too often do I really get to talk with you guys uh, during worship because I'm focused on our next song. But uh, in my research of music this week, I, uh, I stumbled across this church in Texas uh, that was in a spirit series just like us. And uh, I found this amazing quote that they shared, and I want to share it with you. And it comes from uh, poet Guillaume Apollinaire. And he wrote, come to the edge. And they responded and said, we can't, we're afraid. Come to the edge. We can't, we will fall. Come to the edge. And they came and he pushed them and they flew. And so what really tied this in for me is I thought about the spirit this week and um, the spirit, this poem is perfect if you just put the spirit into it. So I want you to hear it once more. And the spirit says to us, come to the edge. And we want to say, we can't, we are afraid. But still the spirit says to us, come to the edge. Still sometimes we want to say, we can't, we will fall. Persistent as it is, the spirit says, come to the edge. And if we come, we will be pushed and we will fly. Isn't that beautiful? So we're going to take this old hymn this week, one that's familiar to uh, many people. We're going to slow it down. It's going to be ridiculously high. And I invite you to sing just as you're able to. You sing. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me.
done my child under in that red. Tears of joy roll down my cheek. It's beautiful beyond my wildest dreams. I want to run green up pastures. a nice picture or a car, taking her to dinner, and maybe, just maybe, letting her play Jedi Knight Fighters from the planet Typhon with us, or, you know, whatever she wants, anything is fine with me. It's your day, Mom, what should we do together? Happy Mother's Day. Join with me in a moment of prayer. Thank you, God, for bringing us in. Thank you for our moms. Thank you for those women out there who have been grandmothers. Thank you for the ones who've taken it upon themselves to to be that mother figure for so many of us. Guide us today as we celebrate not only moms, but uh, celebrate you. Guide us recalculating our lives people led by the spirit we ask this in Jesus name amen recalculating it's been our uh, theme the last few weeks and it's going to be our theme for a while longer this isn't working there we go I don't know if that was me or you we'll try it again And today we're going to talk about the theme from the uh, standpoint of, at least to those who are regular churchgoers, one of the more familiar scriptures. It's from John's third chapter, and it's the, uh, oh, Devaney, it's going to be you running it today. It's from John's third chapter, and it's a story of about a guy named Nicodemus. Nicodemus is uh, coming to see Jesus. And uh, it tells us in the beginning a little bit about him, and I'll say a little bit more about him in this setting when it's done. Now, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? And Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, 
and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. There's a lot we can learn about this fellow Nicodemus. But the thing to pick up right away is this. Nicodemus is at a stage in his life where he's doing a little recalculating. And we can know this right from the opening of the reading today, right there in the first verse. It says these words, Now there was a man of the Pharisees, he's named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night. He's a big shot. He's a religious leader. He is one of the ruling priests of the people. He's an expert in the law. And he's living in Jerusalem. And the, the ones who were able to afford to live in Jerusalem, you know they also came from very wealthy, very successful lineage. In the social order of his day, Nicodemus is, uh, well, he's up there. He's at, the, he's at the top of his heap. And we know he's at a recalculating point in his life because that simple phrase, he came to Jesus by night. They didn't have street lights back then. You had campfires or you had a few candles like this, maybe an oil lamp. And so when you went out at night, it wasn't always safe. And so if you went out at night, it was usually for a variety of reasons, most of which weren't good, but one of which was to hide to do something at night when no one would be able to see you that you wouldn't be willing to do it in the daylight. In other words, Nicodemus, this guy who's made it to the top of the social heap, says to himself, there's this itinerant preacher from out in the sticks, that's what Jesus was at that point, just an itinerant preacher from the Galilee, a backwater part of the world, who's come to town. And he's, I'm hearing some of the things he's saying, I want to ask him a little bit more about this. But I'm an important guy. The whole city of Jerusalem looks to me. I can't be going there in the daylight. I mean, what would people think? Something's going on in his life. Because he still goes. He goes at night. He knows something's not right, and he wanna go, wants to go and ask Jesus some questions, but he doesn't know what it is. So he's going to go a little bit, go at night. That's Nicodemus's story in a nutshell. And so he gets there, and he starts having a little Q&A time with Jesus, and Jesus brings up a couple of concepts that we want to wrestle with this morning. First of all, he talks to him about being born again, and he gives him some very clear words. He says, look, if you're going to be born again, you're born by the Spirit, and you're born through the water. You and I get water. If you've hung around churches at all, you know we do this thing called baptism. It's symbolic or maybe a sign of your relationship with God. These days, it's mostly done with, with infants. But, you know, back in the day, it was adults getting baptized. Adults get baptized sometimes these days as well. So we get the water piece, but he goes on and he says, you've got to be born of the Spirit. And what does that mean? What is the Spirit? Okay, well, we've heard Father, Son, Holy Spirit. We can kind of put that piece together. Being born of, well, maybe that means being led by the Spirit. And that's the point we want to pick up today. We need to have some Spirit leadership in our lives because that leads us to this second concept, and that is the kingdom of God. Now, followers of Jesus, when they stumble over this phrase, and it comes up 60-odd uh, times in the New Testament, kingdom of God, well, they typically make a couple of assumptions about it. The first assumption they make about the kingdom of God, well, it's what happens when we go to heaven. 
they say to themselves, you know, when we get to heaven, we have the pearly gates there. We know there's God on his throne above. That sounds like a kingdom. So kingdom of God must be when we go to heaven. Or the other assumption they make, if they've read the Bible well and they've gotten to that last book, Revelation, and a few other places in Scripture, they know the book starts talking about the end of all things and that history will come to a conclusion. And they say to themselves, oh, the kingdom of God, it's that thing that happens at the end of all things. Some point way off in the future when, you know, like Revelation shows, things get a little wild and a little intense. But God creates a new heaven and a new earth, and that's the kingdom of God. Those are the assumptions followers of Jesus typically make. Eh, they're both wrong. The first one is completely wrong. Jesus never mixes the kingdom of God and heaven as terms. They are two separate concepts to him. Heaven is about where the soul resides. The kingdom of God has a different meaning. Nor does God, nor does Jesus tell us that the kingdom of God is just something at the end of all time. Now, is there a component about the kingdom of God that is about the end of all things? Yes. But primarily, that's not the kingdom of God. And so we are left this day begging a question. What is the kingdom of God? When Jesus uses this, What does he mean by it? Well, let me give you a sample that comes from Luke's 17th chapter that describes the kingdom of God as Jesus typically uses it. Being asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look, here it is, or there. For behold, the kingdom of God is in your midst. In other words, the kingdom of God is in the here and now. When the people connect, when they come together, when we live the kind of life that Jesus talks about, when we try to be a little bit at least the people God wants us to be, the kingdom of God is happening right here right now. You know, there is an answer to this question. Uh, One of my favorite answers to what is the kingdom of God comes from a theologian down in Sydney, Australia. His name is Graham Goldsworthy, and he's got a nice, simple little catchphrase. He says, the kingdom of God is God's people in God's place under God's rule. Notice that definition. It's not future tense about sometime at the end of all things. It's here and now. And notice as well that the fundamental focus of it is on God, not on us. And notice its clarity as well. God's people in God's place in God's time. So think about it for a moment. moment. If that's the kingdom of God, What does it really, I mean, really look like when you get down to it? Ask yourself some questions like this one. If we were really living as God's people, God's place, under God's rule, would women in our world have to feel afraid when they're alone? You know, this church has a ministry where we fill up backpacks with food for hungry kids in our community, that we give it to them on Fridays, and and they take it home with them during the school year, and it enables family to stretch their their budget a little bit for food. Let me ask you this question. If we lived in a world that really was God's people, God's place, under God's rule, How many backpacks would we have to pack? None. You know, we do a soup kitchen once a month here. It's one of literally thousands of soup kitchens that are in the United States. 
to feed people on the margins of our society. Let me ask you this. If we truly got serious as a society, as a civilization, as a world, with the concept of God's people in God's place under God's rule, how many soup kitchens would we need to run? None. If we were God's people in God's place under God's rule, how much violence would there be? How many wars would be fought? How many lives would be destroyed by drug abuse or alcohol addiction? How many people would know the curse of loneliness and the sorrows and the agonies of the tortures of the addictions and the brokenness of their relationships? None. You see this, um, this kingdom of God thing? We look at it and we think, oh, Maybe if I make a little change, I can get there. And that's the problem. We're like Nicodemus. We want to go part way. He has to recalculate his life. So he says, I'll take a small step. I'll see Jesus. I'll do it at night. No one's looking. And we're the same way. When we want to recalculate, we want to do the small step. We don't want to do the big turnaround transformation. And the net result is we end up, well, we end up with no real change at all. Because small steps, well, they just kind of keep you moving along, but they don't get you where you want to go. Have you ever gotten lost and, and your GPS starts saying that recalculating phrase? And it says, now take a turn here and then take a turn there. And it tries to get you back on the main street, right? It's not as easy as that. Sometimes we got to recognize that we need to make the big turnaround. I saw this powerfully illustrated on an article I saw on the Internet this week. It was about a guy over in Switzerland. He was following his GPS. It was a, a van, a delivery person was driving his van. And so the, the, the GBS told him, make a small turn here, and he made a small turn there, and another small turn there, and pretty soon, well, he found himself literally on a path halfway up a mountain in Switzerland. He got so far up there that when the rescue people came, the only way they could get him off the mountain, they had to bring a helicopter in and fly the van off the mountain. And so a reporter asked him about it afterwards, and he said, you know, the GPS kept saying, turn here and turn there, and he, well, here's the quote. Show him on the screen. I kept hoping each little turn would get me back to the main road. And that's us. Oh, don't make me change. Don't let me get radical about this kingdom of God thing. Don't make me really follow the Spirit completely and totally in my life. I want to make the little turns. And, you know, eventually I'll get back on the main road. Only the truth is, if we keep going up some lonely pathway to some empty mountaintop, could never get there. Finally, his GPS, and I've never had a GPS do this, told the guy to turn around. Look at his van. There's no turning around that van. And that's where we get. We get so far up, off on our own, in lonely, desperate places, that then we think it's time to turn around, and it's just that much hard work. Thank the Lord there are rescuers out there who can help us even in those places and lift us up, which is what the Spirit does. And so the challenge for us, if we want to live kingdom lives, is to follow the Spirit's lead. And the key to doing that is to commit. Kingdom living doesn't start when you die. It doesn't start at the end of time. It's in the here and now when we commit to following the Spirit's lead. Oh, 
are we serious about that? Are we ready for that commitment? Do we really want to go there? Yeah, I think we do. Because when we make that commitment, our lives turn around. When we make that commitment, we become agents to turn around the lives of others. When we make that commitment, something in us, something here, it's redeemed. When we make that commitment, lives around us, they get redeemed. A couple of years ago on NPR, I heard a story about a gentleman by the name of Chen Sui. He is, I've never met him, but I'm convinced, one of the most remarkable individuals in the world. Let him see Chen Sui. He lives in Nanjing, China. And though I can't agree with his taste in baseball teams, that's a Yankee cap if you can't see it. He is a remarkable man. On This American Life, they had an interview with him. In 2003, Chen Se lost his job. He was literally pensioned off by the Chinese government that runs the whole society. So he's got you know, enough to give him a little food to eat and a roof over his head. He could have said, that's it, I'm done. I have a purposeless life. What's the point? And just sort of turned inward and spiraled downward and gotten lost into a life with no spirit. But that's not what he chose to do. He noticed that outside of his home was one of the longest bridges in all of China. It's the bridge across the Yangtze River there. It's four miles long, and the way Nanjing is set up as a city, it's heavily trafficked by commuters. And in China, a lot of them are in trucks, a lot of them are in cars, a lot of them are in buses, a lot are on bikes, and a lot of people have to walk that bridge every day. It opened in 1968, and from 1968 to 2003, it was notorious as the bridge where more people committed suicide than any other bridge in the world. Over a thousand desperate people tossed themselves into the river from that bridge. And then Mr. Chen came along. And instead of giving up and packing it in, he decided to be a person committed to following the Spirit's claim in his life. And so he started walking the bridge every day, identifying people who looked desperate. Since 2003, 176 people have had their lives saved because one person said yes to the Spirit. And when a reporter asked him how he knows which ones are just walking to their jobs and which ones are lost, you know what he said? I look for the spirit or the lack thereof. Commit to the spirit. And in one small corner of China, on one little bridge, a little bit of the kingdom of God breaks out. See the two guys with their back to the camera? Mr. Chen, uh, when he started out, he couldn't be there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I mean, he, he would literally die of exhaustion. So there were times he would miss people. But of the 176 he saved, they found a commitment to kingdom living too, including those two guys who were both previous attempted suicides who are now working with him to watch the bridge 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Commit to living in the kingdom and the world changes. But here's the point. Doing that, well, Jesus tells us through his little encounter with Nicodemus, you don't get to decide where you go. You don't get to take half measure. You don't get to go part way. You're either in the spirit or you're not. Pick 
one. Can't do the Nicodemus hiding in the night anymore. Those days don't work. They may make us feel good about ourselves because we are trying, but they don't change lives and they don't change us. Jesus uses one of his favorite metaphors for the spirit, the wind, when he talks about it. He says, the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You don't get to choose where you go, you go. You don't get to choose what comes next, you just do what comes next. You don't get your wishes met, you get the wishes of God and your assent person. Now what does that look like? come back next week. We're going to talk about that. But for today, understand this. It deconstructs our fundamental expectations of what we should be in this world and puts us on a path of authentic personhood. No longer do we have to follow the rules of what society says we should be like. You know, like Nicodemus who hides at night because he's a powerful person and he doesn't want the world know he's going to this backwoods country preacher named Jesus. Now we're authentic people. Which brings me all the way back to that thing so many of us are celebrating today. Mother's Day. You know, once upon a time we had an expectation of mothers that looked, well, something like that up there. Right? Right? Mother always had just, you know, the makeup just perfect and was cooking that fabulous dinner. And, of course, the apron was on and the house was kept. And that was a mom, society's expectation. Truth be told, we still live with a lot of those expectations. Have you heard the phrase super mom? We expect moms, mothers, and women to be all of that, plus go out and be breadwinners, plus do a hundred other things. And for the gentleman here, we're killing the women in our lives. I hope we can own that, if nothing else. That's not what the world needs. It doesn't need people living up to the world's expectation of what it looks like. It needs people who are willing to live up to authentic relationship and taking hold of those moments when we can really live the kingdom kind of life. You know what the world needs? The world needs Jedi moms. A mom who sets aside getting dinner ready and doing this and doing the other things and jumping out there and grabbing a lightsaber and holding on to that moment, that precious moment when she can play with her kids. The world needs Jedi moms. The world needs Jedi dads who understand that their task list needs to be set aside for the relationship with the loved ones in their lives. It needs Jedi children and Jedi grandparents. It needs Jedi friends who say what really matters isn't what the world thinks I should be, but what the Spirit has commanded me to be. Jedi moms. Jedi dads. Jedi friends. Follower of the Spirit. Living in the kingdom. Amen.
Lord, thank you for this uh, bright, sunny day. Thank you for the onset of spring in our lives. Thank you for the opportunity to, to gather and celebrate the mothers and the mother figures in our lives today. And help us to worship in this hour, not just in little turns or small little ways, but with transformed hearts that have recalculated a new path and followed you. God, guide us on that journey, particularly as we lift up the concerns and needs of our community and our, and our loved ones. We pray for our, our brother and sister Bob and Hannah as they uh, committed to relocating to Florida and ask that you keep them on their journey, that you bring them securely through to their new home in the months ahead. Be, Lord, with us as we, uh, as we as a congregation continue to reach out and connect in this world. We pray for, uh, for those who have not yet experienced the gospel message, who don't know what kingdom living tastes like or feels like. And we ask that you make us ones who are in the kingdom, who share the kingdom. We pray for those struggling with infirmity or illness, for those battling it, injuries and recovery from those, for things as simple as the cold or the allergies of this season to complex diseases like a, an upcoming kidney transplant and, and those who are battling cancer. Help us to reach out and care and to grieve, Lord, with those who are grieving and to recall the saints who have gone before us, including a, a grandfather who passed away this week. 
We pray for those for whom the injury or the illness isn't a physical thing that can be fixed, but it's an, a, an emotional boundary that tears them up or a, or a spiritual disease that pulls them apart and breaks them down. Be in those settings as well with the healing of your spirit. And most holy God, be with us as, uh, as we step forward in a few minutes so that we can go out as one to celebrate those mothers in our midst, those grandmothers, those ones who have served as mother figures, who can celebrate with those who are having anniversaries and birthdays this last week or in the week ahead, celebrate with those who are going through exciting transitions in their life, celebrate with those graduates upcoming or just recent. Make life one continuous celebration and show us how by showing us your kingdom and by helping us to commit to a spirit that will lead us there. Oh Lord, help us to recalculate to that path and in so doing, discover once again that you're there for the journey with us and that you will bring us home to your kingdom not in some far future but here and now in our midst all of this we pray when we think of that man long ago who Nicodemus saw but didn't want to be identified with who we see still this day, but don't always openly identify ourselves with. This man, Jesus, who knew what it was like to grieve, who knew what it was like to celebrate, who knew what it was like to experience death, and who knew what it was like to pull us all forward to the kingdom in his life everlasting. And so now we share his kingdom prayer together, saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. our voices and sing. Come set your rule and reign in our hearts again. Increase in us we pray until why were made. Come set our hearts ablaze with hope like wildfire in our very souls. Holy Spirit come invade us now. For we are your church, we need your power. Amen. We seek your kingdom first, we hunger and we thirst, refuse to waste our lives, for your our joy and prize, to see the captive hearts release the purpose.
your beauty changing hearts. You made us for much more than this. Awake the kingdom seed in us. Leave us with the strength and love of God. Right, we are your church. For we are your church. We're singing this song about building our kingdom here, and we hear this wonderful message about the Spirit taking us forth today, and we're singing it like this. <laughs> I'm working as hard as I can up here, so we're going to build it. We're going to sing this chorus nice and slow. It'll warm you up a little bit this morning, and then you got to let loose for our final song, our final chorus. We sing, so build your kingdom here, let the darkness win. Show your mighty hand, heal our streets and land, set your church on fire, win this nation, change the No more of that. Hey, they're going to start showing you some announcements on the screen. If you haven't signed up for small group ministry, that blue slip, take a moment with it. Lots of exciting going on with that. Lots of exciting stuff. Some uh, familiar small groups, some new ones. Also a couple of uh, upcoming events. United Methodist Women, Tuesday, 1230 in the cafe. And we're having a concert here next Friday night. Uh, she looks very blue, I know that. Uh, that's my sense of humor. But there's nothing blue about bluegrass and gospel music. It's going to be a great concert, 6 to 8 next Friday night. Hope you all come out. Hope you bring your friends. No cost, just a great time. And remember, this week, long before Friday night, let God take you to the edge in all that you do. Amen. Thank you for joining our live broadcast, uh, second in the series.